Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. There were times in the Old Testament where God told them to take their shoes off because they were standing on holy ground, a place where the presence of God was so strong, so tangible. That's a type of the church today, coming into the local church service, being faithful to attend there. You can worship like you can't worship in your car or even in your shower. You can hear the word of God be blessed straight from one that's anointed and called by God to do that even more than you can get in your private study. The local church is probably the closest to heaven we're supposed to have before we actually get to heaven. Let's talk about we're standing on holy ground today. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandy. Great to have you here today. We're going to do a study on the local church today. In fact, the book I'll be using, a part of it will be for my book on James. I call this the greatest pastoral book in the New Testament. You say, well, I thought, you know, Timothy and Titus were the uh, pastoral epistles. Well, they are, but they were written by Paul to the pastor. This is the only book in the New Testament written by the pastor to the congregation. And James was simply in the pulpit watching what was going on, wrote all about it uh, in his book. And so that's what we're offering today. And again, even comes down to the places of things we can do in the local church, especially while we're there to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. So it simply comes back to this. What is church in the day we live in? We are the church, but we meet in church. Isn't that interesting? And actually that building isn't the church until the church is there. So we make up the uh, body of Christ in this earth. And of course, that's what we're talking about today. And uh, so for those of you watching for the first time, welcome. I'm Pastor Bob Yandian, pastored for 33 years. And now I am teaching the word of God and uh, just love doing what I'm doing to take the and uh, open up the scriptures so that you can understand them even better. And so if you'd like to become a partner with us, if you've been watching for some time, you can do that. Go to my website, bobyandian.com. You'll find a place where you can become a partner with me. And I would certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much. In fact, some of you, again, I've said this before, but you know God has spoken to you already. You should be a partner with me. You just haven't done it yet. So why don't you just be obedient and watch the blessings begin to flow into your life because it comes by simple obedience to God. So let's go to the word of God today. And uh, let's talk about, first of all, what is the local church? The local church is God's design and place in the world today as a refuge and oasis of faith in a desert of unbelief. The whole world is under a curse. But there's a special place of blessing where we come. It's different than any place we go to. It's the place where the presence of God is because that's where the people of God meet. When we are there together, of course, the presence of God is there. Again, the church the church service is a refuge, an oasis of faith in the desert of unbelief. Around us is all the problems of the world. My wife and I were driving to California one year. And uh, just before we had children, so we had our little Toyota and we had it from Tulsa. We were going out there and and uh, we got to the California border. And of course, as we were going through the Mojave Desert out there, on the side was the Colorado River. And the, I mean, this, you know, the desert was just as brown as could be in tumbleweeds and everything else. But right along next to that river is green. And on each side of it, I mean, the, the vegetation was green and everything. That vegetation didn't have to worry about anything. And whether the rain came or didn't come or whatever, didn't worry about any of that because why? It was right beside the water. That's what the Bible tells us in Psalms. It says that God has made us and has called us to be a place where the rivers of God flow. And by that river, he says that all we have to do is be there, meditate in the word of God, and we will be like a tree planted beside the rivers of water. We just draw our strength from that. That's also what a church service is. God has designed that we as believers in this earth draw strength from his word each and every day. But there's something special about coming to church. It's more like a river in that respect, because the person up there teaching and ministering the word of God, those leading in praise and worship, that is the call on their life. Your call is to study the word of God, but you'll never be able to draw out of the word of God what others who are called into the ministry do. Because you can take a look at a passage and think, wow, it's a wonderful passage. Get some notes off of it for your own personal study. Go to church next week and pastor preaches on the same thing. And you go, where did he get that? And you look at that verse and say, well, it was there all the time. I never saw it. That's where somebody who is called into that position and you need to be under a pastor. So again, that refuge, that oasis of faith in a desert 
desert of unbelief, no wonder the word of God tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. I love what the Greek says, as the habit of many has become. You start missing a service or two, it turns into a habit. Then you have excuses every week for not coming and you didn't get used to give excuses. There may have been a reason why you couldn't come to church, you know, a vacation or somebody really sick at the moment. But the point of it is, uh, the church service is a place we're supposed to be no matter what the conditions of our life are. If we can make it, we're supposed to be there. Our prepared table in the midst of our enemies in this world is the local church. And the local church simply opens up the word of God, serves this great meal, praise and worship is there. And the worship in church is like heaven with rejoicing and refreshing, a great praise and worship service in a church. Oh my goodness. I mean, that's where you take the the CD home with you and, and you listen to it in the car and all that, because why in your car, it's just like you're back in church, all that wonderful sound coming in and you're part of it. You just can't do that by yourself at home. Oh, you can try. Maybe you hit those notes in the shower like I do once in a great while. But again, that sense and feeling of, of and participation in a giant group of people worshiping God, there's nothing like it. And then to go straight from there into the word of God. So the presence of the Holy Spirit in a church service is almost tangible. I mean, you can sense it, feel it. You walk into a service where the people are just rejoicing and praising God, and you can feel it everywhere. This is the closest to heaven that you're going to get on earth, a place where there should be fullness of joy as the local church. And again, a greatest presence of angels. We're told in the word of God that angels even attend church and desire to look in the things we do. I had a man tell me one time, he said, you know, I saw demons in the church. I said, well, good, I'm glad they showed up. They've got to endure the word of God and endure praise and worship. I said, but I want you to also know angels attend church. They love praise and worship. Man, they got their wings lifted up and their hands lifted up as they're worshiping worshiping God with us. So I said, let them come as far as I'm concerned, because everybody that's there is going to hear the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter three and verse 17 says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty and there is freedom. I do not believe that there's any, I, I don't believe that the Lord just picked this time period and called the church age for no reason. It's the time of the church. It began on the day of Pentecost and the church will be here until the rapture of the church when it's taken out. And in that time, we are living in the church age. And I don't believe it's any accident. He called the local church, the church. He called the body of Christ, the church. And the body of Christ as the church goes to meet in a church. And when we are there, that's the pray, place where the Lord is. To look at that place through the week and still call at your church. I mean, I know what you're talking about, but you know what? It's not really church until we're there. I mean, if somebody rents that building out during the week and, you know, and, and they have a, a you know, a, a homeschool class there or something, that's fine. But it's not really church at that time. It's just used for something else. And after the church is gone, Jesus Christ comes back for us, use the building. And, you know, if the church wants to meet there, fine. But again, the building is just a building, but it's the church when we meet there together. In Genesis chapter three and verse 17, we find this out that the ground was cursed when Adam sinned. This earth had no curse in it until Adam sinned. Once he did, God said to him in Genesis 3, 17, he said to Adam, because you've taken heed to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In hard work you shall eat of it all the days of your life. He simply said, you listen to the voice of your wife, not that she was the one held responsible. In fact, he was the one held responsible because she didn't know all the facts and he did. And so we're told in Timothy that uh, she, she went into it, but she's not held accountable for it. Adam was held accountable for it because he was held accountable over her. And so he said, because you've listened to her and she's listened to the devil, you've been listening to the devil, but you're the one that could put a stop to this, but you went ahead and did it. He said that uh, the tree which I commanded you saying you shouldn't eat of it, you did. So cursed is the ground for your sake and hard work, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. The ground received the curse and everything made out of the ground received the curse. And so that included uh, plants, animals, that included our human body, and so all these things were cursed because they came from the ground and the ground still carries the curse and will 
until Jesus Christ comes back to set up his millennial reign on this earth. And on that day, he will remove the curse from the ground. The Bible says the oceans will clap their hands. The trees will clap their hands at the coming of the Lord. And all of nature will break forth into the same glorious liberty as the children of God. That's in Romans chapter eight. So we have our curse removed as far as our physical body whenever the rapture takes place and those who have gone to heaven without a body before us will come and get a new body. Our body, if we're alive and remain at that time at the coming of the Lord for the church, then our body will be made brand new and we'll go to heaven to be with the Lord. And so we'll come back later, but at that time, that's when the curse will be lifted off the earth. So the curse is lifted off the church at the rapture of the church. And I'm talking about your physical body. Your spirit is brand new, been born again. Your soul is being renewed day by day by the word of God. Those are the two parts that go to heaven when you die. But the body stays here when you die and goes into the dust of the ground again because that's where it came from. But there's gonna come a day when God's gonna remove the curse on the earth. And on that day, the lion will lay down with the lamb and the child will play with the poisonous snake, all these different things because there'll be no more poison anymore in any part of nature. So Adam's sin cursed himself, cursed Eve, it cursed the ground and all that came from the ground. The ground then produced thorns and weeds and poisonous plants and everything made of dust was cursed, including animals and even man's body himself. And from that, that curse that's in his body, then spiritual death came in. And so man basically died from the outside in. The nature of the flesh came and his body was cursed. And then the curse came inside of him. And when it did that, his spirit died. But Jesus starts removing those things and redeems us from the inside out. So when we get born again, our spirit's born again. The next thing that starts being affected is our soul. As we study the word of God, by the renewing of our mind, we become a disciple of the Lord. And then one day, again, at the coming of Jesus for the church, our bodies will be made new. So we are saved past tense, that's our spirit. Present tense, that's our soul. Future tense, yet to come to pass, our body will be redeemed from the curse that's been placed on it because of the sin of Adam. So we who are redeemed have a new spirit again and a soul to be renewed day by day, but still have a body made from the ground that remains cursed and will be cursed through our entire lifetime. And if the Lord doesn't come, the, the, the body will go back into the ground and then again, come back up as a redeemed body when Jesus comes for his church. So Jesus redeemed the earth at the same time he redeemed mankind at the cross. Luke chapter 22 and verse 44, what a great verse. It says, then, he, then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Whoa, isn't that interesting? The blood that redeemed all of mankind is also the blood that dropped into the ground on that day, but that's not going to literally come to pass for mankind, even though we've received Jesus and God sees us as born again and takes us to heaven, our bodies will one day be redeemed. But again, we received salvation as far as God providing it when Jesus Christ died for us and his blood was shed for us. And so the church will gain a redeemed spiritual body and lose their cursed natural body at the rapture. Until then, we have a decaying and temporary body, but the earth will enter its eternal redemption from the curse of Adam at the second coming of Jesus to set up his kingdom on the earth. That is seven years after he comes back for us at the rapture. Our redemption, like shoe soles, put a temporary barrier between the feet of the redeemed and the cursed earth. We'll talk about that when we come back. See you right after the break. It did not take long for the dark clouds of legalism to form over the church at Jerusalem. It would eventually end the church there in 70 AD, but by 50 AD had already hindered the ministries of Peter and Paul, who eventually left the Jerusalem church for James to oversee. As pastor of this troubled church, James recognized the argument of faith versus works as a major issue, along with the pride and evil speaking which were infiltrating and dividing his congregation. James was compelled to address these issues both with his congregation and the Jews who were scattered abroad. In a New Testament commentary on James, Bob Yandian uses his personal notes in a verse-by-verse -verse study of the best pastoral epistle ever written, showing the heart of a true pastor and how devastating legalism can be to the church. To order, visit our website at bobyandian.com.
Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Welcome back. Thanks for being here. And again, don't forget that the book on James is a very important book. So if you order it, I want you to remember something. Bob highly recommends. It's one of my favorite books of the New Testament. Of course, whatever I'm teaching on at the moment is my favorite subject, but that is really a great, great book. I want to go back to a statement that I left just as we ended the first half of this broadcast. Our redemption, like shoe soles, put a temporary barrier between the feet of the redeemed and the cursed earth. In other words, whether you're walking around the house barefooted or outside barefooted or with shoes on, that's not what God sees. Your salvation included a barrier put between you and the cursed earth. And so that you can come to the presence of God. The greatest place where we do that is coming into church. I've been in church services before. They say, ah, take off your shoes. You know, we are on holy ground. Well, that's true. We are. But there's something else about it is we are we're walking on holiness and holy ground all the time with us because underneath our feet is this barrier that separates us from the earth. And so that's what the redeemed have. God has given that. And so there's all types of examples of this in the word of God and the shoe soles. In fact, even uh, the uh, you know armor that God has given to us includes the feet which are covered with the gospel and the gospel is what's been given to us. And with our feet, we carry that gospel throughout the entire world. The part that comes closest in our life into the cursed earth is our feet, but God has put a barrier under there called our shoe soles. Now this happened in the New Testament. We don't find any instance in the New Testament where we are told to take off our shoes because we are on holy ground. Here's the point. We're always holy ground because God has made us that way. And we look forward to the day the entire earth will be that way, but God has blessed us and redeemed us. And so wherever I go, I have a barrier between me and Satan, unless there's sin in my life. If I confess it, it's like that separation there is again, and I'm no longer being controlled at that moment by Satan. But what is our shoe soles? Well, the Lord's presence temporarily removes the curse from the ground where he was standing. And so this was done throughout the Old Testament. At different time periods, God told them to remove their shoes because they were standing on holy ground. In other words, where the presence of God was at that moment, let's just take Moses for a moment at the burning bush. When Moses was at the burning bush and stood there, it's like that burning bush just sanctified the ground and Moses didn't even need to have shoes on. God said, at that point, he said in Exodus chapter three and verse five, he says, do not come near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you are standing right now is holy ground. Acts 7.33, Stephen quoted this verse. And so Joshua also quoted it and sought before the battle of Jericho. And so we have here again, different instances in the Old Testament where God t- tell, told them to take off their shoes. They were standing on holy ground. That just simply means again, where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom and mean freedom indeed. So again, let's talk about Joshua before the battle of Jericho. This was again, he spoke to the first one that led out the children of Israel from the uh, land of Egypt into the uh, into the wilderness, and that was Moses himself. And before Moses ever got to this place, he was out there again, tending sheep, came to the burning bush, and this is where God told him he would deliver Israel. And at that time, he told him to take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Here's the thing that's so important. Where the presence of the Lord was in that day and stood just over a certain spot, that meant that the curse on the ground right there was gone. You could stand there with your uh, shoes off and not be afraid of the fact that this is a cursed earth. Well, it is a cursed earth, but where the presence of the Lord was, there was no curse. That's why God said, take them off, because where you're standing is holy ground. Joshua chapter 5 and verse 15 says this, The Lord came to him as the commander of the Lord's army 
And this was, of course, the angel of the Lord. The highest ranking angel in heaven has always been the uh, the archangels that stood around the throne of God. And uh, Satan was one of them. He was one of those that stood around the, the throne of God. He was the highest ranking of the highest ranking angels. The anointed cherub that covers, he was called. So the cherubim are closest to the presence of God and they constantly are beside him. And so the, and then the seraphim are the ones that, that roam through heaven shouting the holiness of God, but the cherubim, God is said to be the one that dwells between the cherubim. So again, Satan was the highest ranking of those. He was the highest ranking of the highest ranking angels in heaven, but he fell. And so again, when in Joshua chapter five, he's called here, Jesus Christ is called the commander or the leader of the Lord's host. And so here Jesus is the one that rules and reigns over all of the angels underneath them and the third member of the Godhead, but also our redeemer. So in Joshua 5.15, Jesus Christ himself appeared before Joshua as the commander of the Lord's army and said to Joshua, take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy. He said that to his predecessor in Exodus chapter three and verse five. Now in Joshua chapter five, before this great battle he was about to go into, God says, understand, I'm going to be the one that will fight for you. I'll be the one that will be your commander. I'll be the one that will defeat your enemy. So take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy. You know what that is today? That's the local church service where we come into church. You know, again, like I said, I've come into church to say, take your shoes off for just a moment. Understand we're standing on holy ground. Well, here's the good news. The church service is holy ground, but on top of that, I'm holy ground. Even though I'm still in a cursed body, God still calls me holy because his blood fell into the earth and cleansed that earth at that time. It will not totally take place until Jesus Christ comes back, but the redemption has already been provided. When I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, it's because it's already been provided. The blood of Jesus was shed for me. I just have to accept it. The earth has been wanting to accept it for so long as far as the redeem of God coming back from heaven and the earth being removed from its plan and redeem from its curse that's on it, that it's going to happen one day. Like I said, there's going to come a day whenever the trees will clap their hands, the oceans will clap their hands at the coming of the Lord, and the earth will break forth into the same glorious liberty as the children of God. The local church service today is that. Look at Acts chapter 4 with me, if you would, in verse 31. Here it says in Acts 4.31, here the congregation had come together. This is when John and Peter have just come back from being told never to preach again in the name of Jesus. And they said, no, sir, I don't care what you say, whether to obey you or to obey God. You pit us against the word of God, you who are in leadership, and we're gonna go with the word of God. If you're just making natural decisions, they, they line up with the word of God, fine. You can make the laws you want to, but when you start making laws that we have to disobey God and obey you, then we will not do it. I love that attitude. That's what we need to understand today. If our government pits us against the word of God, we have to go with the word of God. They did it in a loving way. They did not get mad about it. They didn't get obstinate about it. They just simply laid it out there and said, you have given us no choice but to follow after the word of God. And so they left from there, the, they did, and went back to the church service and reported everything that had been done. And here's what happened when they got through reporting this. Acts chapter four and verse 31 says, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. That's what the church is. It's a special place in a world that is cursed. It's a place of blessing for us to come. It is an oasis of the presence of God. And I can tell you this, that probably the closest to heaven you're going to come is coming to church. Now, some of you may go to churches that don't preach the word of God, don't have a good presence of the Holy Spirit. I would just recommend you start asking God in prayer where you're supposed to be. Now, if you're called to that church as a means of helping them and helping them become more in the presence of God, you do that like a missionary. But I'm here to tell you, otherwise, you need to find a church where there's a presence of God, a presence of the word of God, a presence of the Holy Spirit, because God commands you in the time we're living in not to forsake the assembling of yourself together as the habit of so many has become. In the New Testament, we're not told to remove our shoes in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's been done for us at salvation.
It's been done for us in Christ. God sees Satan as already under the feet of the church, under the feet of the local church, and that's where he's given us. We're told that we now stand in the presence of God and Satan and his, and his kingdom has been placed under us. No wonder he told his disciples that they were to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the works of the enemy. Tread means to walk upon. We've got that on our flags today. Don't tread on me. Well, that must be Satan yelling out at the church, don't tread on me, but God said we have the power to do it, the authority to do it. Why? Because he has been placed under our feet. And whether I walk into the church and take my shoes off or don't take my shoes off, I want you to understand something. Even with my shoes off, I stand on holy ground, especially when I come to church. It's the place of the presence of God that's so different than anywhere else I go. And pastors, you shouldn't back down from the fact that when you meet together with the, with the family of God, there's a special presence of God that comes there. There's an anointing to teach the word unlike what they can get at home just studying the word of God for themselves. This is a place of greater anointing and presence of the Holy Spirit. Praise and worship in church should be much better than what a person could do in the car by themselves singing to God. Oh yeah, they may have those CDs to plug in. It sounds pretty good, but nothing like real live praise and worship service and the preaching of the word of God and that praise. The only thing that's gonna be better is when we go to heaven itself and stand there and go, wow, Man, our church was pretty close to this, but this is incredible as we're standing there with the multitudes from every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation lifting up their hands before the Lord. In the New Testament, we're not told to remove our shoes in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Why? It was done for us at salvation. It was done for us in Christ. God sees Satan as already under the feet of the church. Our salvation includes our shoe soles, which stand over Satan and his kingdom. Removing our shoes then is only symbolic of this place of blessing in the presence of the Lord. In the Old Testament, it was valid. God said, I'll sanctify this piece of ground I'm standing on. And while you're standing on this piece of ground, you can take your shoes off. I'm here to tell you as far as God is concerned, anywhere I walk as a child of God, I am the church walking through this nation. I'm the church walking through this world and Satan has already been placed under me and he can't rise any higher unless I allow him to. And so we're not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. We're not only in the assembly of the upright, but we are also the assembly of the upright. I'm gonna say that again. We're not only standing in the assembly of the upright in church, but we are the assembly of the upright. We are the church attending church. No wonder it should be easy to be healed of sickness and forgiven of sins in church. Why? The curse just isn't present where the spirit of the Lord is. James 5, 14, is anyone sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, it will be forgiven. We are blessed anywhere and everywhere we go because we have authority over Satan. If I were to ask you, to name the demons in Satan's kingdom. You might start with the rank and file demons. Say, oh, they're all over the earth. Yes, they are. Then there's higher ranking demons that are over nations. That's true. Then there's those that stand right beside Satan himself. And they are the ones who are high ranking. And then there's Satan himself. You can come to the top of Satan's kingdom. And you know what's gonna happen? You say, well, where do we go from there? Let me tell you what's happened. At the top of Satan's kingdom, that's on top of his head, is the foot of the body of Christ and that's where you are. Even if you're the little toe, the bottom of the little toe in the kingdom of Satan, you are still higher ranking than Satan himself. No wonder he fears the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that uses the name of Jesus. See you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.